take on the toughest math competition in the world. Plus, Yoshi shows you how to get the most out of your rotary cutter. And I'll show you a whole new AOL Instant Messenger. It's free. Live from the Tech TV studios in San Francisco, it's the Screensavers. Screensavers. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Kevin Rose. Thanks for joining us on the Screensavers. This is the only place where you can be sure to get live product demos, interviews, tips and tricks, and of course, the very best in computer help. And we've got a great show for you tonight. Yoshi's grinding away in the lab with rotary cutters, and our guests will taunt Sarah and I with math problems. Awesome. And Sarah, what are you up to on the show today? Isn't that, isn't that awful? Patrick and I are going to have to prove that we know less than small children when it comes to math. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm taking you know. no part in this one. <laughs> yeah, you, you I want deferred. nothing to do with the math. Yoshi's like, yeah, speaker no, enclosure is fine. It's going to no. be fun. Word problems. Yeah, Woo! Algebra 2. Woo! Um, actually, besides that, besides embarrassing myself on national television, I'm going to actually show you guys a really cool free aim plug-in. It'll change your life and your aim. Wow, yeah. nice. And Dan, Dan is back. I'm back. The soy milk did I'm not healthy. kill him. Uh, so happy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank was, you. It, was it the soy milk? Was it, what else could it have been? It, I don't think it was the it soy milk. It was the hair. flu. Was it the beer? Or it was the, the uh, flu. No, it <laughs> was not the beer. Sorry, Mom. Anyway, <laughs> so to uh, give us a call, the phone number is 888-989-7879. Also, email us at screensavers at techtv.com. But, but I also want to let you know, tomorrow is our Take Back Your privacy special so we're looking for questions regard, regarding privacy so send in your questions tonight and call tomorrow about an hour before the show and uh, we'll get you on back to you guys excellent time for the news it's time for the news let's start, let's start with the tech news that caught our eye today Sarah of course has the news I sure do the Pew Internet and American Life Project is back in the news the latest survey from the group claims that a number of US internet users that download music files is on the rise again up a whole four percent since the last survey Pew ran just before Christmas who are those people? Eighteen percent of internet users in the U.S. currently download tracks online, which is still well below the twenty-nine percent that admitted to downloading last spring. Of course, that was around the time the RIAA started its lawsuits. What do you think, guys? What's going it's, on here? It's pretty interesting. If you read the, 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 the Pew report, they're like, we, we don't bias our questions, we don't differentiate between unauthorized and authorized right. music downloads, and they're like, pretty much numbers are way down but a lot of people are starting to download uh, legal songs off of you know iTunes and Walmart and Rhapsody so I think part of the reason that the downloads have gone up is because more people are using legal downloads. Do we have any idea what the numbers are as far as illegal versus legal downloads? Um, I think it's like 14 percent of America and, and this is rough I don't have the report in front of me. I think it's 14 percent of Americans are downloading and 7 percent of Americans are or have experimented with the legal download mm. sites. Right now there's I think the the peer-to-peer -peer sites are outnumbering the legal sites but the legal sites are Growing, like up to like 11 million users. It's the Pepsi iTunes giveaway. You know what? How many free songs did you get off that giveaway? You know, I despise Pepsi so much, not one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I got a couple, but I don't even drink the stuff. So I just yeah, you away. don't even drink soda. Yeah, I don't but drink soda. The, uh, I mean, what's interesting, though, they're saying is, is some of the peer-to-peer, -peer, some of the reason it also went up is because people went to like Emule and, and some of the other lesser-known peer-to-peer right. trading systems. Little underground ones. Yeah, away from Kazaa. Good stuff. And actually, the reports, if you want to read them, there's some fascinating stuff at pewinternet.org. Excellent. One of the nicest gifts anyone gave me was a little, it's like a little manila folder that had three Pepsi bottle caps in it. Aww. They sent me their iTunes songs. They were kind of sticky and dirty, but I appreciate it nonetheless. <laughs> We have to be careful sometimes what we get in the mail. We've, we've got some strange stuff in the mail. I, no, I think the strangest though is what the 900 individually wrapped peeps that you got. No, I got I got a oh, pair got of yeah. women's underwear in the mail. I kid you Whoa. not. No, this is it was kind of it was really crazy. That was about six months ago. I, I'm not knows kidding you. Did Dan I say you that stuff? Those. Officially got me beat. Dan. Dan did not send those. <laughs> I'm out of this joke. <laughs> Look, another news story, Sarah. Yes. 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 Let's move on, shall we? News.com is reminding us that Apple opened its iTunes music store a year ago tomorrow. Can you believe it's been that long? And currently sits on top of the online music sales heap, a one that seems to grow every time you turn your back. iTunes faces competition now from Napster 2.0, longtime music software company Music Match, not to mention Rhapsody, Music Now, Music Net, Real Player, Coca-Cola, 
of course, Walmart. And Sony, Virgin, Yahoo, and Microsoft, of course, are launching their own sites later this year. According to NPT, NPD, excuse me, group stats quoted on news.com, iTunes has 4.9 million subscribers. Walmart has 2.7 million. Napster 2.0 has 1.9 million. Music Match at 1.5 and Real Player at 1.3 million. Of course, there's probably a lot of overlap going on there. Spokespersons for music download websites, Music Match and Napster claim the real future of online music sales, of course, is going to be monthly subscriptions. They can convince users to lease their music instead of owning it. So hopefully Patrick's broadband connection won't go down next time he wants to fire up some Barry White when oh, yeah. things get hot and heavy. <laughs> uh, yeah, the whole rent thing, I don't get that with music. Buy I don't CDs, ever want to picture Patrick down, getting hot and heavy. <laughs> <laughs> This is the Sorry. man who's talking about getting the you know, wind and... Inappropriate <laughs> mental <laughs> images. Yeah. Like, how does Walmart have the number two slot? Walmart is the single largest source of retail just about anything yeah, but if in you're the a kid, United States. Uh, it seems like something you get beat up for doing. You know, like you download your music from Walmart. That's not the cool thing to do. Like You, you know, hey, you know what? It's, see, if, if, if you're saving 10 cents a song going from 99 cents right. to 89 cents, then every 10 songs you buy, you actually get 11 songs instead of 10. I don't know. It's The kid's got to be downloading because I hate to think... If it's not the kids, like we go up to Walmart. Have you ever seen? Have you ever seen this webpage? No, it's I like, okay, even, the Walmart I don't think I've ever been to Walmart.com. Okay. This is my first time. Okay, this is a first on the screen savers. <laughs> iTunes is definitely has a huge lead, but check this out. Is there, is there, like, usually, I think they have, we were looking at this morning. There's, there it is, the top ten list. Redneck Woman from Gretchen Wilson, The Reason <laughs> from Hoobastank, Maroon 5, This Love, My Band D12, and it's on and on. Britney Spears, Outcast. And somebody was like, oh, it's not nearly as sophisticated as the iTunes top one. Like top ten list, and we went there and we found half of the same band. Pretty much the same stuff. Yeah, so you know whoever's using it. Oops. Oh, iTunes. Somebody little squatter has that domain. Let's try there iTunes. dot com. Yeah, Hoobastank, D Twelve, Maroon Five, Outcast. Pretty Beyond, much the same stuff. Britney Spears, Avril Lavigne. Yeah, it's uh, it's the same brilliant taste in music has been driving commercial radio here in San Francisco. Well, iTunes. The only thing that they have for everybody else is the iPod, of course, yeah. because you can't play music from Walmart. dot com on your iPod. So. Well, actually, you could if you converted it to MP3, MP3 yeah, and then re encoded it. But you know, the same yeah. thing, if you've got iTunes, you can't, you know, the AAC encoded stuff, you can't play it on any other player right. without burning to a disc and re encoding it and re it. It's a superior it. format, though, don't Is you? Is it know? really? I don't know. <laughs> and around and around and around they went. Good stuff, Sarah. Thanks. Good stuff. Thank you. At least our name isn't Hoobastank. <laughs> yes, yeah. Welcome to Hoobastank, your source of prime tech information online and on TV. <laughs> that is a terrible name. Wow. Terrible. But now, Kevin joins us on the Tech TV Netcam Network from St. Louis, Missouri. Hey, hey, Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Hey, guys. How's it going? Good. How about um, yourself? Sorry. How you doing? Um, not too bad. Have you ever been to the Walmart.com? No, I haven't. So check yeah. it out, man. <laughs> right. Great prices on paper towel. <laughs> <laughs> what can we help you out with today? Well, I'm having a problem uh, with remote computers and hackers trying to get onto my computer. I have uh, traced and got IP addresses for it, and I'm calling to ask you guys, what can I do about it? Is there any actions I can take against them or anything I can do to block them completely out? How do you know that somebody's really hacking you? Uh, on my Norton has internet, uh, the internet security has intrusion detection, and it pops up a window telling me the IP address and what port they're trying to get in, mm -hmm. and that's what's telling me. Hmm. Yeah. Well, the, the thing about uh, uh, consumer intrusion detection systems is that they're notorious for false positives. Yeah. A lot of people. You know, plop down forty dollars on an intrusion detection system. Say it'll warn you when you're under attack by hackers. And then the second they go to do anything, whether it be access like an right. online music store, and the store comes back and pings back their computer. Something horrible is at the gate. Kill them! Out. Kill them! Yeah. I mean, we should point. We're, neither one of us are huge fans of a running software firewalls in your system. It's it's much better than not having a firewall, but it has to be very complicated right. having a software firewall in your system. And two. In the, the Norton firewall, we're particularly not that happy with, especially given the price, especially given all the free uh, free tools you can use to protect your system online. The flip side of that is, is if somebody once sent me this email list, right? It was like, I'm getting pinged from these addresses. It's obviously hackers. And like, we did some research, and it turned out to all be internal servers belonging to their ISP that uh, were basically trying to figure out who was using Talking their back cable and modems and, and who weren't, yeah. and updating and. 
Um, it's it, one sure you can trace back the, the IP address. You can figure out who it belongs to. Yeah. And then you can send you tell them to quit it. The problem is is sometimes it's hard to tell if it really belongs to them or if it's been spoofed. Right. Uh, if you do have the IP address and you are getting flags. A particular application I really like is called NeoTrace. Let's, I have it actually pulled up right here. And what you can do is you can type in any address that you want to trace and find out where the server originated from or where are the attacks coming from. Um, I don't have a particular IP address, so I'll just put in like uh, KevinRose.com, my website there. And you can see here we're in San Francisco, and I, I did a trace earlier back to Chicago, but you can see my, my server is located in Dallas, and it will also give you information about who owns that IP address. If you want to report them, uh, you can click on the registrant and find out who owns the IP. You can uh, talk to the ISP. Right. And if you're really getting problems and you have been hacked, mm -hmm. you can go you know, and actually talk to an attorney, and they can subpoena these records. They can go to the courts and subpoena the records of who had that IP address at a particular time and find out who was behind the scenes. Do you go to a lawyer first, or do you call the ISP first? Well, yeah, I would call the ISP. Start with the ISP to really find out if there's a serious issue there, especially if you had information stolen and you can prove that it was stolen. Also, the FBI requires that there's $3,000 worth of damage right. before they will investigate something. So if you have incurred some damage, you can go to the FBI directly. Right. But, but you uh, better be able to prove that you have it was to to actually it. damaged. But this is a great tool of finding out where the information is coming mm -hmm. from, who is attacking you, or who's coming after you. Because a lot of times you'll find out, especially you know, if you're in a cable modem system, you'll find it's the 14-year-old script kitty down the street. And you know what, if you figure out it's somebody locally, a lot of times the ISP will call that person. Right, shut them down. The parents will spank them, and they'll basically back off on the software they're running. <laughs> uh, I mean, the thing is, there's a lot of things, you know, is your software up to date? Is your firewall up to date? Is your operating system up to date? Is your browser? Have they all been updated, Kevin? Yes, I do it regularly. Cool. Because that's your, your biggest concern is what a lot of people do is they basically scan every port and every flaw they can looking for a way into somebody's system. Um, you can try to trace them back. Yeah. It's just, it's, a lot of times it's, it's, it's better to have a well-built gate than it is to go outside the gate to go hunting them. 99% of the time it's going to be a false positive, most right. likely. So. Don't worry about it too much. Yeah. Good luck, Kevin. Thanks for the call. And congratulations because he gets a TSS t-shirt for being on that camp. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. There it is. We gotta throw these open so we can throw them. Ooh. It's been lovely, ladies is. and gentlemen. We're just getting started. Are you born a genius or can you be taught? We're gonna have about six young math prodigies and after the break, Yoshi shows you what you should and shouldn't do with your rotary cutting tool, which you might be miscalling a drabble. I'll come up with a screensaver. It continues. But the Dremel is a brand. The tools are rotary cutters, and they come in many shapes and sizes. Yoshi is here to show you some rotary cutters, the accessories, and how to use them properly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, th that's the big thing. They're not called Dremels. They're called rotary right. cutters. <laughs> Dremel is the brand, like Kleenex, you know, tissue, all that but good stuff. if you stuff. walk into the Home Depot and say rotary cutter, and they go, huh, ask them where the Dremel oh, is. They're going to know what a rotary okay. cutter is. Because, I mean, you got, like, Craftsman. you got all these other brands that sell the same thing that look the same. They're just not labeled Dremel. Got it. Dremel's Bosch Tool Corporation, all that good stuff. They come in a variety of things. First, the rotary saw. A lot of people think these are like, ooh, beefed up Dremels. Mm -hmm. The problem with these is a lot of the accessories for the Dremel aren't going to work on these. Got so it. you're going to be a little more limited. These are great if you're cutting through drywall, cutting on an electrical box, something like that, mm -hmm. even cutting through some plastic. But they're just not going to do the trick for the small, intricate work most modders are going to want. Got it. So that if you're form. cutting drywall, cutting some router for a sink, stuff like that? I happen to have one because I you know, help friends out do construction and cool. stuff like that. And, build on my own house so I can fund stuff. The classic Dremel rotary cutter. The classic Dremel rotary cutter. You know, you got your standard speed control over here, which is interesting, but the problem is it's on. I dropped it. Oh, it's still on. Right on top of the incredibly expensive Fordham rotary cutter. Oh, that's we'll fine. <laughs> the Fordham's made solid. It'll be little, Show the little scary blade on the end. The little scary... It's just an example of, you know, a little saw blade. Okay. These are great for, like, wood or plastic. Or right through it like drop butter. it on the Fordham. Or drop it on the Fordham. I probably dented the blade more than anything else, actually. What about uh, battery, uh, battery powered The battery powered ones. ones. I got two examples of the battery powered ones here. Mm -hmm. um, I buy tools a lot because I'm kind of a compulsive tool guy. This little one... It's trash. <laughs> Why is that? Um, it lasts about ooh, two or three minutes. Mm -hmm. um, you try to bear down into something, it immediately stops. Right. It has no power. It's it's like a cheap portable you power know, you could, I guess someone could buff their nails with it or something, but it's, <laughs> it's not going to work as a tool. Okay. The larger lithium-powered ones work great for, like, you need to go out to the car to do a little mm -hmm. something. You don't want to string an extension cord out there or something like that. Got it. Those are great for that. Um, they have the digital ones, which are cool, so you can set you your speed. Yeah, you can set your speed. It's Seven. 
7 It just RPM. means you, you know you're always using it at a similar speeds. For like plastics, you want to use a nice slow speed because okay. you know, higher speed is going to melt the plastic. So it makes it easy just to go, okay, I know I'm going to slow so speed. So instead of going, well, that sounds like 3,000 exactly. or 20,000. Now, the Ford M, on the other hand, is the tool that I like to use. I know. Um, nice, big, beefy motor. This is their, their high-torque, half-horsepower motor. Should I be the motor stand for you? Um, well, we got another one there this motor stand. We can show that guy right there, actually. Um, the nice thing about them is the foot control, which I have here on, my, on the table. It, it basically allows you to, one, if, 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 if it stays on, you let go, it turns off. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to drop the piece and worry about it bouncing all over, hitting your leg, cutting Take you up. Take a chunk out of your thigh. All that good stuff. The ni other nice thing is, you know, you can have it just... Barely, barely, barely rotating, or you can have it going full 20,000 RPM. It's not set to it's a, a single of, it's RPM. It's a lot of control. It's okay. just totally linear, really easy to do. They come with a variety of hand pieces, so it's really easy just to pop one hand piece off, pop another hand piece on, next piece. Cool. Next tool. Very cool. Always, always glasses like you're wearing. Mm -hmm. I'll put some on. Um, I have a tendency to wear my glasses. I buy OSHA approved lenses in mine just because right. I'm kind of lazy. So what you're saying is you're already wearing your safety glasses. I am already wearing safety glasses. I get to wear the cool guy shop. You get to wear glasses. the cool guy shop people teacher glasses. A cool trick I've learned for not mm -hmm. marring up your surface is use tape. Um, it's kind of silly but you can also draw on it which is nice. But say you got your Dremel going here and you're, you're cutting something and this piece accidentally up. Oh, you touch the piece. It just touches the tape. Right. Over here. Well, you've just destroyed the paint. You're going to repaint your box. That would be bad. <laughs> and, you know, you're looking at one of these custom painted systems. you got 20, 30 hours in the paint. You don't want to redo it because of one little stupid ouch. If you're buying your first, you know, rotary cutter, you recommend buying the, I the recommend kit buying of the 4,000. Yeah, I mean, most of them come with these kind of small basic mm -hmm. kits like this, which, you know, can give you a couple bits, a couple sanding, you know, drums, mm -hmm. a couple cutoff discs. But it's not going to be enough to really do everything you're going to need to go and until you've been using it for a while you want to get a large assortment then start buying them each because they're going to be like eight nine right. bucks each and that gets real expensive if you're just buying them individually and you don't know what you need yet okay um another hand piece i like these these little carving ones for the fordham what these are really nice for is you can use them almost like a pencil so you, you were starting to cut out this yoshi i had here and it's really great for doing window etching something like that it makes it real easy just to get in there and get some fine control over the detail level. Mm -hmm. um, the other nice thing is it's quick release, so it's just change your pieces. Very nice. When you're buying like the sanding drums and the cutoff blades and stuff like that, buy them in bulk. Buy them in bulk. Buy them in bulk. I buy these little cutoff discs in the mm -hmm. 20 pack, and I wish I could buy them in cases of the 20 pack. Because <laughs> whenever it. you're cutting through metal, you'll, you'll bind, they'll snap. Right. <sighs> Invariably at 2 a.m. when you one. can't find anything that's open. Good set of cutting burrs. If you're going to be using those, use lubricating wax, oil, engine fluid, anything to keep mm -hmm. the life of the burr up. It's going to make the life immensely, immensely longer. Vices, never cut something in your hand. You're right. holding something in your hand like this. We both Oops, have the It goes into your hand. hand. Yeah, I've done it too many times to. One last safety one tip. One last safety tip. And I've, my, my best friend almost choked himself with a nice little uh, apron while he was uh, drilling something. You're wearing something loose in your bayou. Oops, it just caught up on there. And that's wrapped around your neck, yeah. choking you. Especially if and you have you a can't half horsepower. <laughs> um, yeah, that happened to my friend. He literally wrapped around his neck, and we had to cut the apron off of him because it was choking him. <laughs> so wear tight clothing. Don't wear loose stuff. <laughs> Keep your distance, use your safety goggles, buy in bulk. Ladies and gentlemen, Yoshi has the tips and the tricks on how to use your rotary cutters safely and efficiently up at thescreensavers.com. It's a great article there. Still to come, we've got a challenging math equation to solve. See if you know the answer in just a little while. And up next, find out how to boot those wireless freeloaders off your network. Kevin's going to show you when the screensavers continue. We didn't have a chance to show you. Yoshi wanted to make sure you knew about getting high-quality bits like these from SGS Tool Company. Here's the thing. They come in a nice case. Why? It's because they're not going to last you. Excuse me, they are going to last you about halfway to forever <laughs> if you remember to wax them and oil them properly. But the point is, is you can buy 30 cheap ones or one good one. They'll probably last around the same time. Trust me, good bits, good cuts, and uh, fewer trips to the hardware store. Yes, like that good thing. Now, Brian joins us on the phone. Where are you calling from, Brian? Renzo, Minnesota. How are you guys oh. doing? Good. How are you doing? Doing okay. Has it gotten warm yet? Um, to a certain extent. It was warm for a while, but it got cold again. Aww. We've been hot here in San Francisco. It's been weird, like 75, yeah. 80 degrees. It's been pretty hot. But don't worry, by June it'll be back down to 52 and foggy. It'll stay that yeah. way until August. <laughs> what can we help you out with? Well, um, yesterday you guys said that war driving thing was Kismac. So I downloaded it and I was looking around and I saw a lot more wireless networks than I've seen for a while. So mm -hmm. I looked at mine and 
I know there's a lot more people on my network than there normally are, and I was trying to figure out a way to get them off. Ah, uh, so people are leeching from you, they're using your internet access, and you don't want them stealing all your bandwidth, basically. Yeah, and they've like basically cracked my web. So, oh. Like, what, what kind of a wireless access point are you using, Brian? Uh, Linksys. Have you changed the password on it and all that good stuff? Yeah. And they're still able to log on? Well, I mean, like, I had changed it, like, a while back, and it still was, like, now it's something that's, like, numerical and uh, with the letters. So mm -hmm. I was kind of wondering how little they got past that, because somebody well, told me, like, they shouldn't be able to. Right. You need to, uh, the first thing you need to do is you need to change your web keys every right. so often. And also, there, if there, there might be a firmware update out there that allows for that new version of web. What is it called? I can never uh, remember the wireless, name Wireless, uh, WPA, Wireless is it? Protected Access, I think it's called. Matter of fact, I'll look that up. Is right that what right. it is? But there's an update, and it's a new version that basically they haven't found a crack for yet. So you're going to want to run something like that so that, you know, people can't get into your system. And we should say, are you running the, the, the web, the wireless equivalency protocol on this, Brian? Yeah. yeah so you have web turned on. So are you like in a college town, or do you have some really annoying neighbors? I just have some really annoying neighbors. Oh, man. Um, well, one thing to do is, like, it takes several million packets of right. information to crack a web key. So that being said, if you change it, you know, once a week, you should be okay. Right. That's a pain. That, that's really, you really shouldn't have to do that. You can also limit by MAC address. Um, I'm not sure if your link says, does your link says come with that option? Because some of the newer ones do. The older ones don't. Yeah, I think it should. It's one of the new G ones. Okay, if it's okay. one of the new G ones, you may want to put in there your specific MAC address for right. your laptop's uh, wireless card or your desktop's mm -hmm. wireless card or whatever you have. And then it'll only allow, not only will it use WEP, but it'll only allow machines with that MAC address now, to log that, on. Can you pick that MAC address out of the stream as, as, as you If they're using things like Aerosmith and they're able to get other people's MAC addresses and they can then plug it in and there is actually MAC address spoofing, so that might also right. fail. Um, another thing, uh, a good application I want to show you real quick uh, before we get too far into this is an application that's called AirSnare. I don't know if you've seen the, I demoed this on the show a while back. It runs, you run this on your desktop and it's going to monitor, constantly monitor, uh, your wireless activity and it'll give you an audible notification when someone connects that is not allowed to connect to your Wi-Fi uh, access port. So it'll just, you know, it'll say actually in, intruder detected or something along right. those lines so that you know when someone's on there and then you can then boot them off That's or, or uh, go from there. Something you should do, Brian, though, is see whether or not the, the WPA, the Wi-Fi protected access upgrade is available. I know it's available on some of the Wi-Fi cards. See right. if it's available for your base station. If it is, update the base station, get uh, WPA enabled Wi-Fi cards. And uh, man, that's annoying. Yeah, that is annoying. Check out this application too. We'll put links in the show notes. It'll be something to. Would play the loading with. the Linksys on a router like this would that give some uh, level of control? Linux on the Linksys, you mean? Mm -hmm. uh, it really doesn't add anything else, any other functionality to protect against stuff like that. Like right. you said, the best way would be to get that update and run that new uh, encryption. Good luck, Brian. Thanks for the call, Brian. Now here is Sarah with a quick tip. Thank you. If you're looking for quick tips and tricks from the Dark Tipper, Mad Modder, or even myself. I like to call myself the Download Goddess, then look no further than thescreensavers.com. Scroll down to the section labeled More Tips right from our homepage, and there you're going to find all sorts of good stuff. Like this one here, how to build your own computer case. There's also an archive for each tip, so you won't miss a beat. Now, don't go anywhere. I've got an alternative to AIM that would let you do so much more. You just kind of love me. And after the break, a behind-the-scenes look at some talented young mathematicians. What it takes to be a real genius when the screensavers continue. <laughs> The screen savers. I'm Patrick Norton. Coming up in this half hour, Sarah's going to show you a cool alternative for AIM, and you can find out how much you can update your website using your netcam. We got a good software treat for that. And here's a great question for you right now: What's it like to compete in the world's most grueling math contest? Steve Olson, author of Countdown: Six Kids Buy for Glory at the World's Toughest Math Competition, followed the 2001 U.S. team to D.C. to discover more about what makes a math prodigy tick. Welcome to the Screensaver, Steve. Thank you very much. This is a pretty wild story. What inspired you to follow this this group of kids to? It, 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 and it was an international math competition. International competition, been held every year since 1958. I always knew it would be a great story because it combined math, mm -hmm. this intellectual endeavor, with really an athletic competition, and that's what the Olympiad is about. It's an international competition. About 100 countries send six-person teams, so about 500 kids, the best in the world, competing. 
Is it, can you just hear the brain power humming when they all get into? Is it you know? Are they lined up in oh, a row? Are they sitting at tables? It's a very dramatic event. It takes place in a basketball auditorium, mm -hmm. and you have 500 tables that are set out uh, on the floor. And uh, each kid goes to one table. And at nine o'clock, a horn blows, and they open an envelope, take out a sheet of paper, and there's three problems there, and they have four and a half hours to try to solve those problems. It's really extremely dramatic, but uh, everything's going on sort of inside their heads. And right. Looking at them. So it's like watching the them. SATs, only probably with a brightest, brighter average camper with a pencil. Exactly. They'd, they'd be they'd be 1,600 on SATs. That, those, that'd be an easy test. Now, the typical geek is branded socially inept, a, you know, a loner or somebody who doesn't like groups. It sounds like these kids were a little more outgoing. You know, I think they, they try to be geeks. Sometimes they're expected to be geeks. But the more you get to know these kids, the less geeky they seem. They're all great musicians, piano players. Uh, three of them were pretty serious athletes, a mm -hmm. swimmer, a water polo player. And, you know, this is such an athletic endeavor. It's four and a half hours of sitting there working on these three problems. You've got to be in pretty good shape to be able to do it. Now, people must tease you sometimes. It's an athletic endeavor. It's like, four and a, hey, I'm, I'm serious about watching this football game. This is a four and a half hour commitment in the Lazy Boy. Or is it, is it, I mean, is it, is it just hard to maintain focus? I mean, I, look, I, I, I will admit, my ability to do math, pretty much as soon as I got through my requirements in high school, I avoided math for the rest of my adult life. Obviously, these kids aren't doing that. How do they maintain the focus? Well, they, they train. I mean, they have to train hard to be in this position. I mean, one way you can look at these kids, you can say, you know, they're just genius kids. It comes easy to them. But that's not the case at all. I mean, they work very hard to be able to solve these problems. I think uh, it, it's probably the case that most math professors couldn't solve these six problems in the nine hours that the kids have to solve them. And I found it interesting. Some of the kids were actually in one of the locals. I don't know how many were actually in Oakland, but I know at least one were taking courses over at Berkeley, which is pretty serious competition to face with and actually sure. working with some of the math professors there on the side. Yeah, well, these kids are largely self-taught. Uh, I mean, they can go through a year of high school math just by reading the book for a couple of weeks. And after that, what they're really doing is working on this separate activity of problem solving, trying to get, get good at that. What's the mathematical equivalent of running sprints or doing jumping jacks? I mean, do you sit down and do your times tables in your head? I mean, are That's they doing logarithmic equations? or? You know, it's not really that because these, uh, these problems require sort of a different set of skills. Like, mm -hmm. these kids will tell you they're not real good at calculating, at, uh, at multiplying big numbers in their right. heads. What they're really good at is coming up with unusual ways to solve problems. So it's really a creative thing, and that's and that's how they practice their creativity. I mean, one thing they do is they'll play they play games all the time. When they're not doing math, they're always playing games. They'll play chess, but they won't play regular chess. They'll play variants of chess uh, mm -hmm. where they sort of make up new rules so they have to think through how chess would work in this alternate uh, universe. So a good mathematician is less about being able to calculate numbers and more about being able to wrap around a problem and find a solution. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Very yeah. cool. So you brought an example of one of the math questions. Well, not one of the Olympiad problems, okay. but this sort of this example uh, illustrates the, mm -hmm. the change in thinking that you have to, be, to, to that you need to become a good Olympian. Right. So the way this problem works is uh, uh, a, a monk leaves his home at eight o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and walks up a mountain. He reaches the top of the mountain at twelve o'clock, mm -hmm. uh, stays overnight on the mountain, and at eight o'clock the next morning he leaves the top of the mountain and walks back down to his home and also arrives at twelve o'clock. So your task is to prove that there was a time when the monk was at exactly the same spot on the mountain on those two consecutive days. Uh, so so that's, the, that's the challenge. What, what is that time when he was at the same spot? Or was there a time when he was at the same spot? And you're going to tell me there's a mathematical solution for well, this. Well, see, what's interesting about this problem is there's a hard way to solve it, and right. there's an easy way to solve it. Now, the hard way to solve it is the way you're taught in math mm -hmm. classes. You would write an equation. You would say, well, you let the... Uh, the distance that the monk has traveled be equal to x and then the time that he's traveled is t but the complication about this problem is that you don't know how fast he's walking in fact uh, given the problem he can walk part way up and then come back down he can walk at different speeds it's very complicated now sarah i'm already feeling the pain are you feeling the pain here yeah you know this question was given to me before the show and i've got i'm doing the complicated stuff you know you i've go. got i've got mountains <laughs> i've got 8 a.m. grid we're going straight across that was kevin's idea i was like no that doesn't work I mean, I, I, I feel like I'm missing something, but there, I think that there is no way to prove that he was ever at the same spot at the exact same time on both days because he could have sat in one place for five minutes and then run. Exactly. Or go, right? go most of the way up there and come back down. <laughs> Say that I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so do you guys give up? You don't. Uh, you want uh, a solution at this I point? No one. Up. No one's going to come up with it. Uh, okay. <laughs> They've been thinking about it. And I've heard some possible solutions over the course of the afternoon. So, 
you have to think about the problem in a different way. Right. And that's why it illustrates the way that these Olympiads work. So the way to solve this problem is not to write an equation. Mm -hmm. It's to say, okay, let's invent a second monk. And on the second day, we will send him up the mountain, traveling exactly the way the first monk did on the first day. At some point, those two monks are going to meet. You've got the monk coming down the mountain, you've got the monk going up the mountain, and where they meet is the time that proves that they were at the same spot on the mountain on two consecutive days. And it works no matter what the monk does, whether he goes fast, slow, sleeps, jogs. Uh, they're always going to meet at some point on the mountain at the same time. You know? I'm having the same moment I had. I'm, I'm feeling 16 again. I can rebuild a carburetor. <laughs> But have an electronic ignition, though. That's, yeah, uh, matter of fact, I can do that because I don't have to solve math problems. I just have to observe the results and then interpolate. Oh well, I like it. But what it, you know, it's 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 this is non-trivial stuff. This is pretty serious challenges. Some of the some of the problems in the book basically made me want to curl up into a ball and cry. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the people I knew who actually are good at math were like, "Wow, that's impressive." One of the things we noticed, though, there didn't seem to be any women on the United States team. Yeah, it's true. As of the year that I wrote about the team, the 2001 team, there had been 119 mm -hmm. members of the U.S. teams since the U.S. started competing. 118 men, one girl in that entire time. Is that because, like, I mean, I've noticed a friend of mine's like, why aren't there, you know, more women writing about technology? And my th reason is that's because they're smart enough to be good engineers and be good project managers, and they make a lot more money out in the world rather than writing about it like I do. What's the reason? There's, there's, some, there's some truth to that, too. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the one girl who was on the team, a remarkable girl, she's a, a Gates Scholar this year in England and uh, will be doing uh, uh, graduate school in mathematics at Princeton starting next year. She told me that she thinks many more girls could compete on the mm -hmm. U.S. team and that it's really the messages that girls get in middle school and high school that makes it harder for them to compete. If you look at other teams from other countries, they often have girls on the mm -hmm. teams and the girls do quite well. It's just something about the way that uh, math is approached to the United States that makes it a boys' activity. It's also, at this level, extremely competitive. And a lot of girls say, there's no reason I want to go in there and compete with boys. All right. Steve, okay. excellent book. I highly recommend it. Ladies and gentlemen, for a link to Steve's book, Countdown, Six Kids, Life of Glory, at the World's Toughest Math Competition. Be sure to check out the show notes section of our website at thescreensavers.com. Stay where you are. Learn to update web pages automatically with a webcam. And after the break, Sarah's got the best AIM plug-in ever. She's going to share all the details in the screensavers. <laughs> folks over at Fresh Gear to see what's coming up tonight. Gentlemen, usually I like to talk to you about technology, but today I'm talking to you about magic. That's right, gentlemen, magic. And of course, when you think of magic, you think of printers. I'm talking <laughs> words, paper, they're right there in, your, in front of your eyes. Actually, all right, what if I told you this came from a printer? Huh? Ooh. Not bad, look at that. Tonight we're going to show you a little thing that's going to actually print out anything from cup holders to, well, I don't know, models of patients' body parts. Oh, and you can cool. probably see where that goes, huh? A printer does that. Now, in the future, you know, if you, like, need an ashtray or something, just print it out. Nothing wrong with that, right? That's cool. And this was actually printed. So, you never know. Is that like a desk jet? Is that new from HP? Or what are we talking about? Well, you're going to find out tonight on Fresh Gear, which is after uh, Tech Live, which is after the screensavers. Don't right? drop your cup holder, Chris. Whoa, hello. So, there you go. Thank you for letting me tell you about this, but we'll tell you more about it at Fresh Gear. Fresh Gear's fun, and so is Tech Live, so back to you fellows. They get some cool stuff on that show. I like that. The prints out cups. Stuff. You see what Yoshi can do with one of those things. <laughs> Chris, good stuff, man. Thanks, guys. Take Thanks. care. He's on Fresh Gear, he's on Tech Live, and they both come after this show. That's right. Now, it is time for a download. Sarah? Yes. This is a fun download for everybody who uses AOL Instant Messenger. Lots of us do because it's a good program. It works really well, and lots of other people use it. But I'm always envious of the cool features of some of those alternative IM clients. Kevin has Trillion Pro. It's really cool. It has, does stuff that AIM doesn't do. With today's download, I get the best of both worlds. I get to use AIM, and I get great extra features. It's called AIM Mutation, and it's actually just a free plugin for AIM. It's great. If, and I will say, before I go through the features, all of you who remember Dead AIM, 
Uh, it was great. It was fun. It was free. It's now it now costs you. A mutation does exactly the same thing, but more free. So there you go. Let's look at some of the features. If you if you look at the here's my buddy list. It's, it's my window that's open. It looks a lot like AOL Instant Messenger, but it's got some some changes. And when you, you use the drop down menus, everything is pretty much the same. You go, oh yeah, this all looks exactly the same, except now I have this immutation bar here. And when I open up the settings, this gives me all my extra features, which is really cool. So for example, show advertisements on the buddy list. No, let's not do that because nobody likes that. And if I want to change the way that it, my background looks, for example, I've got, I can completely skin this. It's completely skinnable, but just, and the skins can come from you know anywhere online. You, there are a mutation skins that you can download, but just for the background colors and stuff like that, let's just say I want to change the background color. It is just as easy as that. Now when you look at it, of course, it's a different color. So that's cool. I'm loving that. Now if I move down to some of the other options here, I can enable transparency. And that's neat. When I just right click here, I have this transparency thing. Now of course now I'm at, I'm at zero transparency, but let's say I want to go to about 50. Ooh, that's kind of neat. I can go anywhere from zero to 100. So that's cool. Some people are just so into the transparency. I never have been, but now you can do it. Uh, if you go back to the settings here, you can enable buddy aliasing per screen name. For people who don't know what that is, let's say you've got a million and one buddies, right? And they've all got weird names like Crazy Man 111, and you just can't always remember that Crazy Man 111 is your friend Mike. You can just say, my friend Mike. Even though, you know, that's, he, he can have his buddy name and you can have your Mike name and you can keep everybody straight. You can also log your IM conversations. Now, we don't want to do this to get anybody in trouble, but of course we love to log our IM conversations to, you know, get back at people later. Just fun stuff that everybody likes to do when they're feeling a little immature. You can choose your log folder. You can log your messages, enable real-time logging, log all data when people come and go, all that good stuff. Extra plugins, of course, you have that, you have that option. Pop-up notifications, that's like what you do in the latest version of AIM when so it pops up in the right-hand corner, so-and-so is idle, so-and-so is back from away. All that stuff, you have all the pop-up notifications. As I said, skinning, you have skinning options that just go, oh, quit! Oh my gosh, okay, that's Kevin, and he's sending me a message that I'm not going to show you guys. I'm not going to show you guys that. That's wow. <laughs> That's really funny. Oh, and before before I go, I just want to tell you. Oh, by the way, tabbed route, or tabbed uh, messages too. I've got three messages open. It's all tabbed. It's great. It's fun. Now let's just say that I have to go to the bathroom or I have to do something, and I'm talking to five people at once, and I just want to say the same thing to everybody, like BRB. I'll be right back. I can just say BRB and then hit Shift F5, and they all instantly get that message, which is really cool. It's very simple. Ooh, but very cool. I love that feature, and I can do it with a mutation. So. I want to warn you that this has trouble with the newest version of AIM 5.5, 5.5 point something, 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 but it works perfectly with all the other ones. The best one that I found is 5.2.392, that's the, the, the last stable version before 5.5. Just use that one. If you've got the newest version of AIM, just uninstall it, reinstall the older version, which is in my article, and then if you have a mutation on top of that, you're much better off anyway than the newest version of AIM. Don't let them run your life. So the links are in my download of the day article at thescreensavers.com. When you install the Immutation plugin, you'll be happy you did. I guarantee it. That's it. What's coming up on the show, guys? Excellent. We'll come up after the break. We are going to tell Ryan how to automatically update his website with Netcam pictures. That's all coming up right after these messages. Be sure to catch tomorrow's show. It's a special Take Back Your Privacy special. It's a fine blended edition of the Screen Savers where you'll learn how the U.S. government is trying to control your freedoms. And we're going to show you the right software you can protect yourself from bad people out of the Internet. What else do we have? Encryption. Is it irrelevant to assuring your privacy on the Internet? Bruce Shire is going to talk to us about that all on tomorrow's Screen Savers. But now, Ryan joins us. On the phone from Arm, Armayday, Armayday, Michigan, Ryan. Hey, hey, it's Armado. Armado. Yeah, I live ah. in Hicksville. I'm sorry. Hey, I grew up in Danborough. We had a gas station. Actually, we didn't have a gas station. That was Mechanicsville. <laughs> we had the body shop, the post office, and a bar. I grew up in Las bomb. Vegas. We had lots of things down there. <laughs> Just while you're the dark tipper and That's I'm Mr. Right. Wholesome. <laughs> Ryan, how can we help you today? Um, well, first of all, thanks for answering my call. And uh, second of all, I am, I'm going to upload my website pretty soon. And uh, we were wondering, me and my buddy Ryan, <laughs> we were wondering if we could use my webcam to not make streaming video, but more like a uh, 
picture kind of like on the Tech TV website, how you uh-huh. have your webcams up there every 30 seconds. Yeah. It uploads a new picture. I was wondering if I could uh, do something like that. Yeah, you can easily do that. Uh, we use a couple different applications mm-hmm. to do that. Um, one that I know that we've talked about in the past that Leo uses at home, uh, Webcam 32. It's a classic. It's a classic. What it does basically is it's going to interface with your uh, webcam. It's going to take when the pictures actually happen, it's going to save that image down to your hard drive, and it's going to FTP it to your server and overwrite the same file time and time again. And then all you have to do within the HTML is just reference that one file as an image cool. tag. It'll pull it right into the site, and then uh, you'll be set to go. It'll update however often you want. Like. Normally every 30 seconds is about right. You don't want it to make too right. many FTP connections. Your server's going to go crazy. You're going to be constantly connecting. So i got to know, Ryan, well, what do you plan on posting on the web with your connection? Well, it's just like a picture of my room because me and my buddy Ryan are doing like a gaming site and uh-huh. it's going to show us playing video games. Like a spy cool. cam, kind of. Not, well... You just kind we of don't do much, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so sitting there with the Jolt Cola and... Playing like games. Suicide boys. Eating food. <laughs> have you seen the yeah. beer cam? The beer cam's pretty cool. The guys have it inside so. their fridge. They yeah. use the same software, and you can watch when they go in for a beer. It's kind of interesting. Cool. Yeah, not but, old enough to drink beer yet. Ah, uh, you can, <laughs> you can sneak it. It's not a big deal. The jolt cam. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> the coating cam. Very cool. Right? Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. And uh, there's also one other application I want to mention real quick. Dan, do you remember the name of that application that? That uh, Gila uses our executive producer's wife. I think it was it was a webcam 32 no, or no. spycam 32. <laughs> spycam 32. That's it. There's yeah, another one. Do a search for spycam 32. We'll put a, a, a in the show notes. We'll put a link to that as well. I think that one's a little cheaper and it doesn't have quite as many features, but right. it's still good. Thanks Thank for the call, Ryan. We appreciate. It. Now stay where you are. Up next, we're going to check our inbox to see what's on your mind when the screensavers continues. <laughs> comes from Garrett. He just wanted to let us know that Hoobastank is one of the band members' middle names. Sorry oh. we made so much fun of Hoobastank. Hoobastank. And the next guy, John, says, Hoobastank rocks. You shouldn't make fun of kick-ass bands. Hoobastank sucks. Oh. 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 It looks like Dan wants to start a fight. Down. down. Okay. Sorry. We weren't making fun of the band. We were making fun of the name, which apparently is a man's name. Sorry. Okay. Travin says, I'm looking into buying a Mac laptop because I'm fed up with Windows. What are some good deals on iBooks? And PowerBooks. Mm. Mm. There really are no good deals oh. unless you're if you come <laughs> to Apple. Yeah, because basically they really tightly control their channel, which means pretty much everybody charges the same price, whether it's an Apple store or mail order or a Comp USA or whatever. What you can do if you're a student or a teacher, or if you know a student or a teacher, is they can buy it on an educational discount and save like 10 to 15 percent, depending on the model. So, what do you have to do to, to qualify to be a student? Can you like apply for Home Depot class and? Consider yourself like a. I'm just, you know, I'm trying I'm pretty, to. I'm pretty out. sure it's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's like elementary, junior high school, high school, okay, college, college yeah. graduate school, doctorate. I'm I mean, just checking out that. That's a good dark tip. Thanks. It's, for that. Uh, glad to help. Yeah. But yeah, the other thing is like people are like, oh, you know, if they're like selling it for 50 percent off, it's either stolen or it's something's wrong with it. The other thing is uh, buying used iBooks and iMacs, uh, buying used iBooks or PowerBooks. Not such a good idea. We've yeah. seen a lot of bad things happen to G3 iBooks. So if it's selling for nothing on eBay, it's There's probably because <laughs> it's a paperweight. <laughs> All right. Next question from Matt Moser. He says, I'm building one of those Luba cases with two to four computers in it. I'm wondering if there's a way to use one CDRW on both computers or all of the computers. Ooh, uh, if you could find some sort of removable drive case to slide it in and out, that only works with hard drives. Truth what is he looking to do now? He wants to use a five and a quarter inch of CDR burner right. in two different systems at the same time, which basically mm. doesn't work. You could put it in an external enclosure and drag it from one system. I was going to say, if you put it into a USB hub and then split it into two machines, I don't know. Yeah, you can't yeah. access it at the same time. They kind yeah. of freak out. You drag it from yeah. one machine to the other, but not both at the same time. we got a scoot, folks. That's it for this edition of the Screensavers. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Kevin Rose. Thanks for joining us, and we'd like to thank our guest, Steve Olson. See you next time, and have a great night.